I am going to be pursuing and showing mostly, not all, but mostly mainstream, commercial, Hollywood, well, one hero, we'll talk about that later, motion pictures that were huge hits at the box office worldwide. That is what we're going to be discussing. And the only reason that a huge box office, you know, that, that the, the size of the box office, the amount of money any particular movie made, the only reason that's important for us is that it tells us these were effective emotional undertakings that touched the hearts of millions of people all over the world. And that's what we're going for. What we do is emotional. What we do is convey emotion to an audience <clears throat> because that's what they have come to experience. You go to the movies to feel deeply. And so we'll look at how you cause that to be, how you bring that about. First things first, historical perspective. <clears throat> Once upon a time, long ago, there was a playwright called, uh, named Sophocles. And uh, he was a very, very hardworking playwright. In his life, contemplate this, Sophocles wrote over 100 plays. I mean, Shakespeare only wrote, what, 37? 100 plays, that's a lot of plays. Uh, and only three or four of those come to us today, what's called extant, you know, in, in its whole form. But thank goodness that one of those plays is Oedipus Rex. Oedipus Rex in Sophocles' day was his big smash hit. It was the biggest hit play in his own lifetime that he had. And they loved it, and they put on other productions of it going forward kind of stuff. And he was honored for it in many ways. And that tells us something. And here's my point in starting here. The audiences that responded to Oedipus Rex so strongly and so emotionally for its own culture and time are exactly the same people with the same thought processes and the same functions of processing story as today. Human beings, the body, the mind, we haven't changed in 2,500 years. We haven't really, I mean, you wanna go back 200,000, that's a different story, okay. But no, things that worked, the structure that worked, and I've studied Oedipus Rex, obviously, for that, to, to nail down the structure, it is all there. It is all there in relative to what we're going to be seeing here tonight. So a lot of people think, or newcomers anyway think, that structure is somehow superimposed, and uh, it's not. It's not. It speaks to how the human mind processes story. We arrive on this planet craving meaning. That's how our brains, our brains are physical things, computers, and they search, and they, well, genetically they have been trained to search for meaning in all things. 150,000 years ago, uh, you know, the vague scent on a, on a slight breeze or, or the echo of an echo on the other side of a canyon or something, knowing instantly what these things meant could be the difference between life and death. So through the millennia, it, get, it got baked into the human brain. We all seek meaning, and that's what stories give us. Life is chaotic, life is ambiguous, but we all love the ritual of story turning that into meaning, and that's what structure does. The point being, obviously, structure is your friend. It is not to be dismissed uh, as dangerous to your creativity or something like that. If you feel that way, fine, because I've worked with a lot of grad students who feel exactly that way. Uh, and it's up to me to convince you otherwise. I know that's part of my task, and I take it on uh, you know, willingly. And we will have those discussions and, and arm wrestlings if you like. That's fine with me, too. But the bottom line is, Structure is your friend, and if you want to write art movies and you can't stand Hollywood films, we don't care. Uh, <laughs> the, and, 
The point here being that, oh, and the organization of elements and stuff like that. At Sun Tzu, The Art of War, know your enemy. Know this stuff. And then if you want to go off and write independent cinema and all that, great, great, God, with all of our blessings. Yes, we need filmmakers and writers like that too. But know what it is you are not doing. It's important to know what you are leaving out. Do it intentionally and not just, you know, by mistake. Okay, first, let's construct a specific story, organizing the elements, and that's what structure does. All right, like I said, we're going back to the basics here, okay? There are three things that need to be established in your head when you say, oh, I got a great idea for a movie, or when you have somebody at a cocktail party comes up, you know, bend your ear. Uh, it has to have certain elements to actually be a good idea for a movie. It's not just a place where it's not just a particular character. You have to have a hero, yes, a sympathetic, active hero. Sympathy, there are, there are nine, this is all in the book too, there are nine basic sympathy tools um, that allow you to create a character, any kind of character. Uh, uh, you, even if you like writing about sleazy people, that's fine, do it, but they need still, even that, those folks need certain qualities that make them empathetic at the very least, sympathetic, so that we, the audience, very quickly and at the beginning of Act One and the beginning of your movie can identify with this hero. We have to become emotionally involved. And that's the window. That's the window that you have to let your audience in on. And a hero must be physically active. They must be. We're, that's the kicker here at the end, but uh, we'll get there. How the conscious way that you can build and keep a hero active throughout two hours. Two hours of visual storytelling. That's a lot. And there's a lot that needs to be going on in there. Okay, the second thing you've got to have is a physical, visible, high-stakes goal. This is the difference between novels. We'll talk about this next week <clears throat> in another, you know, approaching it from a different angle too. The difference between novels and movies. Visual storytelling is about creating visual metaphors for interior emotional states. That's what we write. We, we, people can't just stand around feeling. They've, the way emotion and character are revealed in, in visual storytelling is through behavior. People make decisions and they take physical actions in pursuit of the goal, whatever that decision uh, leads to. So in that sense, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but in that sense, plot and character are the same thing. A plot in film, in visual storytelling, only exists so that a hero and other people can behave in a certain way pursuing something visual that allows us inside and, and allows us to know what emotionally is going on inside of them. There's no narrator, you know, like in a novel, telling us what's going on inside of them. We have to see it. Oh, uh, and then a powerful adversary. <laughs> Sorry. Powerful adversary. And I say powerful adversary. You, adversary is the character who is most committed to stopping the hero from getting what they want, whatever the goal is or whatever the genre is as, uh, and so forth. Um, and it is the adversary that creates conflict. You know, the hero can't just say, I, I think I want that chair. I'll walk over there and get that chair. No. You haven't got a story until there's a big brutish somebody or something, an obstacle keeping the hero from the chair they want. And, that, uh, and the conflict must be as high as you can jack it up under any circumstances. That was kind of a quick, very quick sketch of hero and adversary. They, for any story, you must have a hero and you must have an adversary. That is 
because that is what creates conflict. Right? Uh, that is at its most basic. But there are, you're going to trust me for a while on this, there are 14 character categories that work in visual storytelling. Only 14. And that's not a bad thing, actually. <clears throat> it simplifies your plot planning to know and know these categories well, because each of these categories pro yeah, provide characters that must serve the function of either hindering or helping the hero in the pursuit of their goal. If you have a character that doesn't do either, they are not meaningful to the story, uh, and unless they're just atmosphere people, which are props in essence, get rid of them. They can't just hang out there. Although th these categories get uh, rather broad, and I'm going to get highly specific next time we meet on the character categories. You really need to get your head around how to use these, because one of the things I see coming in uh, uh, through the students and uh, the first years and stuff when they start writing and creating their own plots is a paucity of subplot. It is the character category list that gives you on a silver platter subplots. And subplots can take so much pressure over off of your plotting when it's just a hero and just the adversary on and on and on and on. You have to keep changing the nature of the conflict and these other characters are going to help. Just for now, I threw it in here. Okay, that's them. <laughs> Those are the categories. You don't have to rush and, and jot all these down. I'll have handouts. Not tonight, but I'll have handouts. It's in the book also. It's all in the book. But just kind of an overview of what it will take to build a plot that works for audiences and stays focused. There are the categories. All right, now you have your idea, and now we begin to build a screen story structure. Two hours worth, and, and that's biting off a lot. Let's see. First of all, you have to have an idea. As discussed, three key elements. All of them must be in there to make your idea viable for conflict going forward with a story. The second thing you have to come up with is an ending. A lot of people, novices specifically, they say, leave me alone. I'm just going to take these people and I'm going to run with it. I'm going to start writing and making scenes and, and they'll tell me where they want to go. And usually, not always, but usually those scripts end, I mean, are, are, are abandoned about page 48 and dropped in a drawer because they get lost. I mean, the writer gets lost in the weeds. And that's another reason why getting organized is so darned important. There are tools here. It's like, you know, lumber, an electrical cable that you're being offered the tools for building a house. It's kind of hard to just dismiss them out of hand, I would think. The ending, to in large measure, screenplays are written from the back forward, or at least they're constructed from the back forward. Where do you want it to end? You got an idea for a character and a conflict. What is the emotion you want to go for? What is the feeling of that final climatic scene? And where is it going to take place? That is important for you to think through. And pick something and write it down in your outline as you build your outline here. That's, for now, the ending. And listen, all of these things, you're not tied to them, obviously. If you get into this and you, say, you suddenly find something that's a better idea for you and you want to go in that direction, fine, rewrite your outline. All I'm saying is you need the basics lined up so that you're going somewhere. And you, because that's, that's, if you don't know the ending or an possible ending that you are going for, you are inviting writer's block. You really are. And that's how people get lost in swamps out there. And until they just, you know, they can't face the headache and they, uh, and they put it away. Okay, the ending. Stunning surprise one and stunning surprise two. I'm going to spend a little time this evening with examples <coughs> of stunning surprise one and stunning surprise two. Now these, this is my, my name, my, my uh, title for these key moments. 
you probably know them as, uh, it, they, they happen at the end of Act 1 and at the end of Act 2. They are the biggest reversals in your entire story, and you need to know where you're going for them up front. You need to know s soon, plan it, because sometimes you have to work on them to really get them juicy and big. I use the words, what is it? Uh, uh, Sid Field, I think, said uh, it was the first plot points one and two. That's it. That's what he called it. And even Joseph Campbell said it was crossing the first threshold was, you know, stunning surprise one. All of which is true and all of which is great. But I think those are abstract terms. And I prefer terms that are not abstract, even if they're a bit over the top, like stunning surprise. Because that should be the impact of that moment that you are creating for your audience. Really impactful. It should be emotional, visible, and very impactful on the hero. Okay, we're going to get to that just right away here. And of this first order of business, and in what you're lining up, you also need to decide early on, you know, before you start writing script pages, wait on script pages. Because once you write script pages, it gets harder and harder to throw them away. But we'll get on that. You need to know where the beginning goes. Where are you going to start? You know where it ends. You know approximately what some of the big moments will be. <coughs> Who is doing what to whom? The nature of the conflict. Now where do you start? Because you can still blow it there too, you know. <coughs> if you start too soon, you know, if you start too late, even by a, a couple of scenes, you push it because you want to get it moving and rolling. You haven't given your audience enough time to connect emotionally with your hero. That's really important, that stuff that happens up front. And unless it's an action movie, you know, it was James Bond or something like that, which always starts his ordinary world, yeah, is running and chasing and shooting. I mean, that's what he does. So, okay, that's his ordinary world. And you begin there. But you have to give your audience a few moments, some scenes for them to connect emotionally with your hero before you can really get rolling and have them come along for the ride. And I've seen a number of uh, European films, British films for some reason specifically, <clears throat> not all of them, but I've seen them start way too early. And they can go on for 20 minutes or so. There's, there was one uh, called uh, Layer Cake. Was, was that? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a great gangster movie, <clears throat> but I don't know if you're, as I remember the beginning, it just is, it lays there. I mean, they're just talking and hanging out, and it goes on and on and on, and you're waiting for the movie to start. No, picking your, your beginning, I mean, yes, your, be <laughs> your beginning is really important. After that, you got three acts, and you, I think it's helpful to view your three acts or think of them as three worlds, and that's why I broke it down this way by, by way of example. <clears throat> Act one traditionally is called the ordinary world or the hero's life yesterday. What the hero's life has been like <clears throat> up to, very close to, but not past, just before this kicks in, what you're doing. The ordinary world in Act one after the inciting incident, the hero will have a general goal, a general goal in Act One of an ordinary world. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> I'm going to use Shrek here in just a second as an example, but the ordinary world of Shrek, how many of you have not seen Shrek? Okay, uh, I, I figured that would be the case. <clears throat> when I mention these and I use them as examples, please jot down the titles of these movies. Uh, you really, it is well worth your time and effort to get these films and make time to spend time with them and view them. They, uh, I pick them because they're really good examples of, of one thing or another. <clears throat> but Shrek is an ogre who lives in a swamp. And uh, he's happy, he thinks, <laughs> before character growth. Um, but then Lord Farquaad drives all these fairy tale creatures into his swamp, and all of a sudden he just is going nuts. He's got to get rid of these fairy tale creatures because he wants to be left alone in his swamp. 
That is his general goal of Act One. Then he marches off to Duloc, right, to find Lord Farquaad and demand he gets rid of them. This is all Act One stuff. It is the hero pursuing a general goal. And then something happens at the end of Act One to drop the curtain on that and raise the curtain immediately on Act Two, where now the goal has become highly specific. That's what I'm highly specific. And it's, it's often called the Special World Act Two <clears throat> because it is a world that the hero has never experienced before by the nature of the circumstances. Sometimes it's a physical difference, but uh, a lot of the times it's just, I mean, like if it's a, a real life contemporary thing, you know, it's still in Manhattan, but what the hero is now facing makes it incredibly different and special and life or death-ish uh, in Act Two. And then Act Two, the hero uh, uh, forms a plan and pursues the plan throughout Act Two, cobbling it together as it gets, keeps getting torn apart. And then as, at the climax of Act Two, as you roll into Stunning Surprise Two, the plan gets totally blown out of the water and destroyed, and all of a sudden there is no plan. It's a, the biggest reversal in the entire movie. And then that throws the hero into Act Three, where they must improvise. There is no longer any plan. But the best, I think, <clears throat> really useful way to see your three acts is, this is adolescence. This is your hero's adolescence. I don't care how old they are physically, but this is emotional adolescence. And then you get into the special world where they realize they darn well better grow up or they're never going to be emotionally or they're never going to be able to do what they need to do to get to their goal. And then act three is their maturity. Now they're an adult. Now they get it. Now they have overcome some of the emotional uh, reticence within. And they are ready to face uh, the adversary for, for all the marbles. I break one down here as, uh, as an example. <clears throat> okay, this is Collateral. This is a thriller, a, actually a relatively big budget, American thriller that was a hit all over. It got some Academy Awards too, I do believe. Um, yeah, there's a lot to study there. In fact, we may, we may be looking at it ourselves later on in the class. <clears throat> okay, the hero, this is a one hero movie. And the hero is Max, Max the cab driver, ordinary Max. But in Act One, his ordinary world, he has been planning and dreaming of starting his own limo company for 12 years, which, you know, it, he, he doesn't get the fact that that's ridiculous, that he should have launched it years ago, but he's afraid to take that risk. The plan's got to be perfect. So basically, the underlying problem emotionally that Max has is he has no courage. <laughs> then stunning surprise, one happens, and all of a sudden, boom, uh, rear end over tea kettle. He flies into Act Two, and he's been kidnapped by a hitman, being forced to drive him around for the rest of the night as he kills people. And all of a sudden, the lack of courage thing becomes the, mon the, the monstrosity stumbling block between Max and being alive by tomorrow morning. If he doesn't get the guts to do something to confront this killer and take the risks con concomitant and all that, he's not going to live the night. So now there are reasons where he's better start growing up fast. And he does. And it's really great by the time he gets to Act 3, Believably, the arc is so beautiful, the character growth arc. And believably, in Act Three, Max becomes a genuine hero. You know, not a superhero, but he's fighting the bad guy because he's trying to save the, the woman. You'll see, you'll see. But that's uh, uh, another way of looking at it. And as an example of basic structure of that particular film. Okay. Inciting incident. These are the dramatic tent poles. Acts one, two, three. And that, the, the whole point is they need to keep rising, you know. They have to. Or you're going to lose your audience. They can't just float along. Two main things happen in Act One. The inciting incident and stunning surprise one, which ends the act. 
Uh, there's some of these things I'm not going to go into tonight, but the inciting incident, a lot of people mix up the inciting incident with, with Stunning Surprise 1. And you, we'll talk about that going forward, and we'll see a lot of examples. For instance, the inciting incident for E.T., the, es the extraterrestrial. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen E.T. That's, I, I'd like to take my examples from a few years ago, assuming that most of you have seen these things. <coughs> What is the inciting incident of E.T., the extraterrestrial? Any thoughts? Go home. Hmm? Go home. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. yes, uh, yes, it comes to that. But first, oh, oh, find E.T. in the shed. Yes. Well, not in the shed, but close, real close. Um, yeah, the thing is, a lot of people have said that, well, it's, it's, it's when E.T. is left behind and a spaceship takes off. That launches this story. The definition for the inciting incident is it begins this story and no other. Well, it's not, that's not the moment because, number one, E.T. is not the hero, as you know, many of you have already nailed. E.T. is not the hero. E.T. is what's called the endangered innocent. <clears throat> Elliot, the boy, is the hero. And the inciting incident that starts all of this is when the, the, the thing in the shed and all this, and he goes off looking for something strange in, in the high grass and the weeds, and they open the weeds and they see each other face to face for the first time, inches apart, and they're both terrified and scream and turn and run around and run away. That's the inciting incident for E.T because then, from that point on, Elliot is obsessed with finding that wonderful, strange-looking puppy dog and making, making that his pet. And there's this whole, in terms of the, the character growth arc, he keeps talking about E.T. As, as if he was a puppy dog. Uh, and then, stunning surprise one, all of a sudden, when he asks E.T., where do you come from? <coughs> and all the globs of Play-Doh rise, and with power of mind, he is showing him things in the air and you know, pointing at different planets and stuff like that. And at that moment, and that's why I think what he says, what Elliot says is, of all the things he could possibly say, he says, oh no. <laughs> in other words, what he had was all wrong, his assumption about E.T. This is not a dog. This is the smartest, most advanced, incredibly powerful creature currently on the face of the earth. That's what he's got himself into. And that takes Elliot, kicks him, you know, rear end over tea kettle into the second act where the focused goal becomes get that creature home, save his life and get him home. So there's one example. Okay. And that's the, uh, the nature of the inciting incident. <clears throat> Studying surprise, well, let's see, what's next? Yeah, okay. Stunning surprise. Th these are the basic factors of the stunning surprise. Usually, usually, there's wiggle room here, folks, but usually 25 to 35 minutes, it usually depends on how long the movie is. If the movie is two hours, 20 minutes, you know, it can be 44 minutes into the movie. It depends. <clears throat> 25 to 35 minutes into the movie, it must happen to the hero, and it takes place in an instant. It's one of those. It's not a scene that develops and reveals. It's, it takes place in an instant. It shocks and surprises the hero and us and the audience. And it presents what the storyline is going to be about. Just like he, <coughs> Elliot, when he gets you know, kicked into the second act, it very quickly becomes apparent that he knows and we know the storyline is going to be about saving E.T. All right? Okay, <laughs> this, is from, this is from Get Out, that, this amazing film, an amazing launch of, of careers here. It really was. <clears throat> but that is a kind of the moment of stunning surprise. It is frequently eyes large, mouth open. It is a true shock. It has to be a shock to the hero going in. 
Okay, here's an example. So Shrek has gone off. He's really ticked off about the fairy tale creatures. And he storms off to go find Lord Farquaad. He goes to Duloc. Nobody's in the town. And then he hears people cheering in the arena inside the palace. So he heads in there to find there's some sort of contest about to take place. And he sees Lord Farquaad up on top of his draperies or whatever. And uh, Shrek being Shrek, he's not afraid of anything or anyone. He just goes barging on in there to take his uh, complaint to Lord Farquaad, get rid of the fairy tale creatures. <clears throat> but remember, as soon as Lord Farquaad sees him, he says, oh, that gruesome ogre. How horrible, how ugly. New plan, the knight who kills the ogre will be champion. Of course, <laughs> Shrek is completely unfazed. He says, oh, can't we discuss this over a pint? Whatever it was. And so all the knights come after Shrek, and Shrek turns it into a very comical sequence. Very nice. And a perfect climactic action sequence to end an act. Acts rise, even act one, you rise to a climax, and then act two rises to a bigger climax. There has to be a climax to the act. And the audience is, is having a great time. They're cheering him on. And then the lady said, give him the chair. The references, the references to professional wrestling and all that kind of stuff. One by one and three by three, he dispenses, knocks out all the guards and uh, then the people are cheering, and uh, Shrek is having a great time and eating, up, eating it up, and so is Donkey. Donkey's proud too, but then suddenly a reversal. A bunch of crossbows get cocked and pointed at them. Uh, that changes the situation. Oops. And then the captain of the guard says to Lord Farquaad, you know, shall I give the order, sir? Hmm. Being the, and the consummate politician that all schmucky authoritarians are, <clears throat> he says, wait, I got a better plan. And he gives the audience what they want. People of Duloc, I give you your champion. What? Uh, say what? <laughs> There's the look. It is the reversal. Eyes, mouth, the classic stunning surprise one look. And what has that done? Now, Shrek's general goal of get rid of the fairy tale creatures has just become in the very next scene, and he and very quickly, he's told by uh, Farquaad that if you go to the dragon's keep and you bring the princess to me, I will give you your swamp back. Boom. Now. His desire to get rid of the fairy tale creatures in general has become a specific thing. Go to the, dra the dragon's keep, save the princess, and bring her back to Farquaad. Highly specific what he now has to do. That is the function of a stunning surprise one. And all of these apply to uh, Shrek. 25, 35 minutes into the movie, I believe it happens at 26 minutes, must happen to the hero. Always, always must. And it does. Takes place in an instant. I give you your champion. Huh? Yes, it takes place in an instant. Shocks and surprises the hero. Heavens, heavens yes. And presents what the storyline will be. This stunning surprise one does all of it. Fulfills all of the requirements. Okay. Here's another one. Just one more. Four stunning surprise one. Okay, cab driver Max is a sweet guy and very sympathetic on a, on a number of levels. Uh, and he's, uh, I don't know, he's the, one of the most time accurate cab drivers anybody has ever met. His cab is immaculately cleaned. This is something else about your hero. Whatever they do, you know, a nuclear physicist to a cab driver, make them tops at it. They have to be highly skilled in what it is they do. Now, I don't care what it is that they do. You know, at, on all levels, it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's really important. They can't just be a screw-up schlub. You're not going to hold an audience that way. Okay, so another guy has gotten into his cab. He doesn't know yet that Vincent is uh, a killer. 
But he's, he's just dropping him off, took him a fare, and he's dropping him off. But then Vincent comes up with his $600 offer. <clears throat> he said, you stick with me for the rest of the night, drive me around, I got a few more places to go, and then get me to the airport in time in the morning, right? And Max kind of hems and haws, it's against regulations, but he says, okay, it's, it, it's for, a, for a one shift night, you know, 600 bucks is pretty good, plus a bonus when he gets in there. So he takes the deal. In this movie, that is the inciting incident. When Max, unknowingly though, but in retrospect we will see, when he takes the deal that binds him to Vincent and that leads to stunning surprise one very quickly. He says, go around the, and wait for me in the alley. And like a good hero, he doesn't waste any time. The hero should always be doing something. So he uses the wait time to eat his lunch and look at his catalogs <coughs> for the cars he's going to take on lease for his limo service. He's been doing this for 12 years and he hasn't launched it yet. But as he is deep into his reverie, out of nowhere, kaboom! Something big and squishy hits the top of his cab and it happens to be, it happens to be a human being who is squished. Well, the effect that has on Max is uh, quite strong and he immediately goes into shock and he's, he's terrified and he fumbles and stumbles and gets out of the car, falls onto the ground, crawls away, trying to make sense of it. This is not Stunning Surprise 1. It is not Stunning Surprise 1 yet. The reason is this. Stunning Surprise 1 has to change everything, change the hero's life forever. Going back to Shrek, he's going off to fetch a princess, he thinks just, you know, to get rid of the fairy tale creatures. <laughs> that journey will change his life forever, ultimately. He's going to fall in love for the first time in his life, and that will change everything. All right? Here, He's a cab driver, and that's pretty outrageous to have a dead body fall on top of your cab, and it's kind of scary. But realistically, it is not outside of what normally happens in a city. He could, you know, go have a great tale, uh, maybe it'll be written up in the newspapers, and tomorrow night he'll be driving a new cab. His old life would continue. Yeah, it's spooky, and it's big, and it's dramatic and loud, but it does not yet change his life. So, Vincent comes mumbling out, very self-controlled, and uh, Max is all rattled, and he's uh, trying to, oh, but the guy fell, the guy fell, it fell right in my cab. I think he's dead. Uh, good guess. Vincent plays it low-key, and at that moment, the thought finally crosses Max's mind. You killed him. I think Vincent says, you know, I shot him. It was the bullet in the fall that killed him. I mean, it's the kind of cynical, snide guy he is for a, for a killer, right? And even this is not the stunning surprise yet because he has to get that linked up with one more factor before it changes his life forever, and it's this. Uh, Vincent's trying to stop him from running away. Point, pulls a gun, points a gun at him, and, and now he gets it. This is stunning surprise one, and look at the expression. It is the stunning surprise expression, because now he knows the full story, which is, he is the captive of an assassin. And that mean, and he knows, I mean, he, he's seen his face, he's had conversations with the guy. Assassins don't let such people live. So, he now sees that. This is called, you know, ass over tea kettle here in, into act two, because now for the first time, he is in the special world of being a, a hostage of a man who kills people for a living that he has to drive around for the rest of the night. And the possibilities of Max coming out the other side of this, you know, by morning, getting away from this guy are practically nil, practically impossible. 
So now Max has faced a situation he's never faced before, and that is called a special world indeed. How is he going to pull this off? Mild-mannered Max is going to confront this guy with life and death. Act two begins. Uh, and the difference here is, uh, where is it? There it is, 25, 35 minutes. In, in collateral, I think act one is 19 minutes, 19 minutes long. Pretty, sh pretty short for act one, yes. But think about why. This story is about a cab driver. Act one, his ordinary world, almost all takes place inside of a cab. This is a thriller. The movie is a thriller. Um, you've got to get something going. You've got to get the story pumped up and running quickly. Not in 25 minutes, no. People aren't going to hang around. You've got to do it as soon as possible. A lot of stuff is set up in Act One and in that 19 minutes, and we're going to take a close look at this coming up in a few weeks. Oh, the brilliance with which this thing was composed, this first act. But that's why it has to be shorter. And that is another statement of the paradigm being flexible in some ways. Okay, that was Stunning Surprise 1. Then there's Midpoint. Uh, we're not going into the midpoint tonight. The midpoint is juicy, and there's a great deal to be discussed about the midpoint. The midpoint is not a moment like a stunning surprise. It's not just one moment of shock. It is, uh, it's a series, as, not always, but as a rule, it's a series of short scenes in which several key things that advance the story happen, including, and one of them is, is it's a key character growth moment. Uh, and we'll talk about that another time. But now I want to jump to the other key one, most important one, which is Stunning Surprise 2. Some of the same things and some new things in Stunning Surprise 2. This, this is the climax and, and the curtain dropper for the end of Act 2. And a lot goes, I mean, the bulk of your movie. I mean, Act 2 can be 70 pages, even more, of, of your screenplay. And that's why it deserves a lot of attention and a lot of thought and planning, and we'll get to that. It is the biggest reversal in the whole movie. This is the biggest dramatic event in your whole movie. Takes place in an instant, yes. Shocks and surprises, yes. But here, the hero's plan is destroyed. Um, that means, at the beginning of Act Two, the hero kind of picks themselves up, dusts themselves off, and now they have a very highly specific and difficult task ahead of them, a goal. So they start formulating a plan. And sometimes they start gathering allies. It's, uh, uh, Campbell says sorting out enemies and allies in that first section of Act Two. <clears throat> Getting their feet on the ground, forming a plan, and moving forward with it. And at, toward the end of Act Two, uh, you know, as, as the action is rising toward the end of the act and the climax, um, it just, just might be possible for the hero to pull this off. It's looking more and more like it's feasible. And then, boom, stunning surprise, two hits, and the plan is totally obliterated. The plan no longer exists, and it is called the hero's darkest hour. Now it looks like the hero is finished. Let me remind this, it sounds a lot sometimes like I'm only talking about action movies. That's not the case. This in variable degrees is all genres, family dramas. This is what they are too. It's just that these things, these contests, these conflicts become between two people. One person trying to dominate another or convince them of something. Um, all of this is true for all genres that work, that work for audiences, okay? And it it's often called the hero's darkest hour, but I throw this in because I've got an example coming up, to, again, to show you a variation. About five or 10% of all the movies that work have a reversal to the positive. In other words, by the end of act two, the hero is kind of down. And then there, it has to be the biggest reversal. You can't go super down you're, if you're already kind of down, and it goes up. And the big difference is when you do that, and that's fine. 
I mean, there's a lot of romantic comedies and, 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 other, and dramas and other things like that. Uh, Bridesmaids is like that. <coughs> Aaron Brockovich is like that. <coughs> but what that means is Act three has to be very short because the hero has already won. See, so the obligatory scene and the denouement, you get on with those and you wrap it up and you're, you're out, your story is over. Okay, let's uh, take a look at an example. Ah, not yet. This is Stunning Surprise 2 of The Matrix. <clears throat> okay, this is a more traditional Stunning Surprise. This was a genre changing movie. I mean, we've seen all kinds of movies like it now, and the, you know, the twists and the concepts that were used in The Matrix. But when The Matrix came along, ooh, it had impact, it was fresh. These story ideas, the concepts and the way they were executed, they ultimately affected science fiction forever as a genre. <clears throat> so okay, this is a one hero movie, as all of these are, uh, and the hero is Neo, and uh, he just uh, saved the life of his mentor, Morpheus, and, uh, and he was helped by, by the love interest character, Trinity, and he got them to uh, a phone booth, and that's how the, the, the technician on their ship, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar, <coughs> on the, the rebel's ship, that's how he, uh, Tank gets them out of the, mat the Matrix back on, on board the ship, and he got Morpheus and Trinity back on the ship, but then the bad person shows up, the adversary, Agent Smith shows up, and they have a big fight, and it's like a fight to the draw, and uh, uh, Neo is making a run for it, but he had a cell phone, so he's still talking to Tank, and Tank is sending him to another place where he can be extracted by telephone. Okay, they're running, the robots are running after him too, and ah, uh, one of the better adversaries in film, Agent Smith, is also close on his tail, closer than uh, Neo actually realizes. Their cannons are being shot, zinging. And oh yeah, this too, this is what I mean about visual metaphors. We, we, t we spend a couple seconds going back to the Nebuchadnezzar, which has also been si simultaneously attacked by these robotic spiders that are just evil looking through and through, and they are literally tearing uh, uh, the seals off of it, the siding off of it, and they are seconds from storming inside and killing every human being in the Nebuchadnezzar, one of the few groups of human beings still alive in this world. What this does, though, what this does is remind us, the audience, visually, that it's not just Neo trying to save his own life. Neo is responsible for all of these people, and that's what makes him a hero, a true hero. He is doing, yes, he's in danger, but he's got to get back for the protection of other people. And there, the definition of hero. There it is. Okay, he's running down a grungy hall. Remember that, those of you who have seen it. It's, it's an interesting climax. It's visually quite striking, too. <clears throat> he's running, he's running, he's being chased, and he hears a phone ringing behind the door. I guess it's just where Tank told him it, it would be, and he'd better get there fast. And he goes up to the door. I wonder why they picked room, I mean, 303. Usually when a filmmaker puts a number like that, it has significance. Maybe it's Trinity's, you know? two trinities, I don't know. But the phone is ringing, and he throws the door open. Oops. Agent Smith is waiting for him with this hand cannon pointed at his chest. It's over. There is no escaping for, for Neo under this circumstance. His face is smaller, but look at the expression. Eyes wide, mouth open, stunning surprise one. Yes, Neo, you're dead. That is pretty stunning surprisey. Then he braces himself to take it like a hero. And he's shot six, seven, eight times, I forget. It's just the way they've sound, the juice to the sound to make those sound like cannon shots blasting out of that gun. It's very powerful. And, ouch. And then there's another cut back to the Nebuchadnezzar to remind us 
visually. We have to be shown physically and visibly. That's how we get our information in movies, in visual medium. We are once again reminded that if you die in the matrix, you die for real. And that's what this little cut is reminding us. And this is shot, it's got sparks going on in the background. There was some, you know, as, as the, uh, 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 the little spidery things are coming. Uh, it's like the whole place is falling apart, but there's heavenly sparks also. And kabang, he keeps pumping them in, and there he is, the blood smear on the wall, fading, going, going. And oh yeah, poor Morpheus, because Morpheus is, is the mentor character, <clears throat> and he had all his bucks, you know, he was convinced that, that Neo was going to be the one, the prophesied person who would come and save humanity from the machines, right? That's a thing running, running through the whole film. It's this, it's very religious, you know, it's like a Christ metaphor, truly, the whole film is. And he can't believe it, my God, how can he be wrong? If, if, if Neo is dead, Neo hits the floor, dead. He is shot so many times, he has to be dead. He falls to the floor, he looks pretty dead. And then Agent Smith has one of his guys, check him. So he goes up and he's, he's gone. You know, he's as dead as they can make him, right? We get it, he's dead. Goodbye, Mr. Anderson. Okay. Biggest reversal in the whole film? You betcha. <clears throat> Takes place in an instant. Yes, shocks and surprises, of course. Hero's plan is destroyed. I would say so if you're dead. That kind of does in your plan. <laughs> and it's often called the hero's darkest hour. It is somebody's darkest hour there, I would say so. So, and it was very shocking in the theaters. I don't know if you guys you know the first time I saw it. What? How can they just kill off the hero, you know? But they did, and then did something very interesting from there. But that is stunning surprise too. Here is my second, hang on, hang on, I know. It, it's, it, it's tough. Just give me a little longer. I got this one more example. And then I'm going to show you some stuff you're not going to hear anywhere else. So how crazy is that? Hmm? OK, a second example in a completely different kind of movie in Erin uh, uh, Brockovich, right? She's been told, she and Ed, the, the, the mentor character, the her attorney, have been told they need 164 or 167 more signatures. They're going to have it decided by a judge rather than a jury, which takes years. They said, okay, uh, they're going to arbitrate with a judge. So they find, she's finally got all the signatures she needs, but what she doesn't have is a smoking gun, the absolute proof that PG&E, you know, Pacific Gas and Electric, because it was based on a, a real story, that Pacific Gas and Electric knew that they were poisoning the residents of Hinckley. That is what the smoking gun is in this particular story. And nobody's come anywhere near that. She goes, she gets signatures, no smoking gun. <clears throat> so, end of a very long day, but she's gotten her signatures, so she goes to a local bar and cof you know, coffee shop place. But she's still deeply worried about not having any smoking gun. And then down the bar, there's Mr. Sleaze. Remember, Charles Embry, I think, was the character's name. Uh, he's been kind of stalking her for a little while since the midpoint. Just this kind of sleazy guy in the background who's looking funny and eyeing her funny. and He uh, starts to chat her up. The guy tries to start a conversation. This is not a good time, place, or circumstance for Aaron. She needs like this, like a hole in the head. And then he moves in a little closer, oozes down a couple of chairs, right? He slides closer, tries more compliments, says things like, I think you're the kind of person I could talk to. Ugh, the, you know, the intention, it, it's double entendre, of course, you know, but it's nice how they play up to one thing and then reverse it as they are about to. And, of course, she's trying to cool him down, show his little interest, reverse interest, the lack of it, but he doesn't let up. So she grabs her stuff <laughs> and she's taken off. <laughs> 
And when she's actually leaving, <clears throat> she's not going to be there to talk with him anymore. Suddenly, uh, Charles Embry bursts out with, would it be important to you if I told you when I worked at the Hinckley plant, I destroyed documents? What? Bingo. Sounds like a smoking gun to her, right? And next, watch what happens next, though. That is stunning surprise, too. But watch how it is played out. She's getting rattled with Charles. Uh, uh, can you wait with me? Just wait here, wait here. I've I, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back, I promise. You know? And she goes running out of the bar. And she goes, tries to get her phone. And of course, the phone doesn't have any power. And she tries to get change out of her purse. And her purse drops, and the coins fly. And finally, she's so nervous and so excited. She gets Ed on the phone, the attorney. You know, and she gets him all excited too. No, oh, well, just da, da. don't push him. Don't push, let him talk. You know, people like to tell her. And both of them very, very excited. And then she goes back in for a calm conversation with Charles Embry. But the thing is, this, these extra moments. Susanna Grant wrote the screenplay here of, of Aaron Brockovich, and it is bloody brilliant. She does a number of things, little things like this. This is a stunning surprise, but it is very quiet. It is exactly what the hero needs, but it's kind of downplayed and quiet. So all of a sudden, uh, we take her excitement as the hero, and she runs off and shares her excitement with the mentor. And the moment is built to show us the, the depth and breadth of what it means to what they are doing. This is it. We have won. Uh, and it's added you know, to give us a sense of that rising excitement. And very wisely, very, very wisely so. OK, this is the summary of, of type B. OK? Biggest reversal, yes, takes place in an instant. Shocks and surprises. But here, the hero's victory is delivered. You win. There is still an obligatory scene to come, and a highly unusual and extraordinarily emotionally fulfilling one, too, when she goes back to the office and she lays into the, in a, in a comical way, lays into the two stuffed shirt attorneys they've gone into business with and all kind of stuff. Uh, so she gets another victory. She gets a social-like victory that is on top of this one. <clears throat> But this is the fact. Act three better be short. When this happens, you get a short two more hero goal sequences. And we'll talk about that right now. All right. Take a breath. There are two things that drive all screenplays that work, all of them visual stories. Two, one is conflict. <laughs> you got to have lots and lots and lots of it. And if you have weak conflict or not very interesting conflict, you, you're going to lose your audience. But the second one is a bit of an abstraction that haunted me for years, which is you also have to have change. The story flow absolutely needs to be changing as you go forward. It has to be developing going forward. And I found it impossible to, to, to teach that. You know, that was an either, it's one of those things, you either, there's an instinct you have or you don't have kind of thing. But it infuriated me. I've, I've always felt that there was something there that could be teachable. So that's when I went into the weeds and the, the jungles for a few years and started watching movies over and over and over and over, trying to find a pattern in change that had not yet been codified. I know that's a pretty outrageous thing to say and to be looking for. <clears throat> and I was shocked more than anyone when I actually realized I was looking at one. There is a pattern to change in these films, in the way they speak to the human mind and emotions and process this information of story to make it emotionally fulfilling. There is a unit of change that you can get your hands on. And it seemed to me if you could truly codify 
the length and content of one unit of change, you might really have something in terms of the most useful tool for outlining a feature film I've, I've ever seen anywhere else, and I try to stay on top of these things. Define the size and content of the units of change in successful screen stories, and you can build a more effective way to write screenplays. And this is a fact. And the unit of change that I found, I named hero goal sequences. Again, because it, that refers to actions rather than abstractions. Here are the definitions. I'm going to read these. I don't want to, you know, muff it. So I'm going to read it. A hero goal sequence. We're talking about a unit of change. A hero goal sequence consists of three to seven pages of screenplay. There's wiggle room there. I've seen them at two pages. I've seen them at nine pages. Generally, three to seven pages of screenplay, wherein a hero pursues one short-term physical goal as one step toward achieving the overarching goal of the whole story. Then the hero discovers, in pursuit of that one short-term goal, some form of what I call fresh news, some sort of information or object that they happen into that is one of the, you've, you've got to have so many surprises for an audience in a, in a feature film. It is one of the small surprises. And you say, hmm, that's interesting. And that fresh news puts an end to the current short-term goal and offers up the next short-term goal and the next hero goal sequence begins. This is a schematic of it. I, I mean, I started at one, I, you know. Okay, so you come here, you've got a goal, you're searching for the goal, and then boom, fresh news. It is a mini, mini, mini stunning surprise. You know, mini. It's not the big thing. And all of a sudden, this goal comes to an end. It's not needed anymore, or it's completed, or whatever. Then boom, you're up to the next level of involvement and interest and growing tension in the story. Here's an example, concrete time, gravity. But here is where it starts. Hero goal one in gravity is the ordinary world of the hero. The hero of that movie is Sandra Bullock, who plays Dr. Ryan Stone, who is in space working on space station because of a deep, deep wound that she received when her four-year-old daughter fell off of a jungle gym and died. She lost her daughter and her meaning of life in a freak accident, and she is so profoundly in grief, what she has done is gone as far away from life and the earth as she can possibly get into total silence, the depth of silence of space. So she is up there and she's doing her work and her, her goal is to work in space without thinking or feeling. Fresh news, and that, that sequence also establishes other members of the crew and it establishes her, uh, her mentor character, the George Clooney character. Kowalski, I think was his name. And fresh news after X number of minutes is Houston suddenly calls and says, abort mission, return immediately. A wide swath of space junk is heading right at you. And now they're scrambling and trying to get inside with the other astronauts. They're, I think there's three of them out there working at the time. <clears throat> and uh, she's caught up in what she's doing. She's trying to finish and reboot. You know, She's being focused on that. And, and, and Kowalski keeps saying, get inside now. And you can't move too fast in spacesuits and all that. And fresh news, so get inside the spacecraft and return right away. And fresh news become, becomes that they don't make it. The debris storm hits, and they're right in its path. Then that becomes a hero goal sequence three, which is do everything you can to survive the debris storm. You see, those are actions that pile up on each other. 
This is just one taste. I mean, this is, I'm going to have your head spinning with perhaps you think too much of this stuff going forward in the course. But this is the ticket, guys. This is a secret. And here's the weird part. This is what I wanted to get to finally. Thank you for hanging in. Through technical disaster and all. This is what Act 1 looks like. Act 1, listen, you know, hear this, this. I'm still astounded, but this is true. Act 1, in any motion picture that works for audiences and was a big hit, Act 1 of all of them, no matter their genre, have six hero goal sequences in it. Six. Not five, not seven, six. And stunning surprise one always appears in Hero Goal Six. Always. It never fails. If the movie doesn't work, then that's not the case. I mean, I, mean, I, I invite you to, and I've done a lot of it too. You, you've got to watch bad movies too. But from now on, when you see bad movies, I don't want to hear it just, ah, I didn't like it, it stinks. You got to tell me why it stinks. Where did they fail in, in their mission to bring you emotion? How did they blow it? I want you to be able to spot, and you will soon enough, be able to spot exactly why it didn't work. Okay, and the weirdness continues. Here's the graph of Act 2. Act 2 is broken in half by the midpoint sequence. The first half of Act 2 contains another six hero goal sequences. And the midpoint sequence, and every good movie has a really good midpoint sequence, and that's saying something because these aren't easy at all. And the midpoint sequence always appears in hero goal sequence number 12, always. And in the second half, second half of act two, there's another, guess what? Another six hero goal sequences. And stunning surprise two always appears in hero goal sequence 18, not in 19, not in 17 or 16, in 18, in every movie that works emotionally for audiences. Act three is the only place it can vary. <clears throat> Act three contains between two and five hero goal sequences. <clears throat> There's a minimum of two because, remember, there is the obligatory scene and the denouement. Two things are critical and they have to happen in Act three. Uh, and they each need their own goal sequence. So that's why the minimum is two and the maximum is five but hear me please, there are a few really good movies. I mean, my favorite romantic comedy of all time, uh, as good as it gets, it has five, but it has to wrap up so much and there are so many important relationships that have to be wrapped up in act three. Okay, we cut it some slack. I am asking you, short of begging, do not go with five hero goal sequences in your act three. It makes the act too long and your audience gets restless. It, the, the stories or movies we go to and we feel that they have repet that keeps ending over and over and it's still ending kind of thing. That is the feeling you're in danger of creating. Keep act three short. That is what it's meant to be. The average for a successful Hollywood movie that is loved all over the world, the average is 21. In other words, three hero goal sequences in Act 3. Here's a graph of the entire thing. And here is your challenge. This, I believe, is extraordinarily good news for you. You now know, in advance, exactly how much story your screenplay is going to need if it is to be a hit with audiences, if it is to affect them and connect with them emotionally, this is what it needs to be. And I'm, believe me, I'm setting out to prove it to you and I will prove it to you this semester in spades. 
that it's true, and it's true across all genres, because this is about, you know, uh, this takes us back to Greece. This is about speaking to how your audience absorbs sto the ritual of story. That's what it's speaking to. But here's the problem with it. I mean, this is really, I think, enormously useful and valuable knowledge. But take a look at the number of little surprises you have to come up with. I've had grad students, you know, working on, you know, in some of the actual writing courses and <coughs> working on stuff. <coughs> and uh, they said, oh, Eric, Eric, I only got four sequences in the second half of Act Two. That's all I can think of. That's all I got. Can't I just have four in, in the second half of Act Two? And the old taskmaster shakes his head. No, I'm sorry. If you can only come up with four, that means you have to go back in your story to find why that is true. It's telling you that your earlier story has not been built in such a way that this can be provided as you go forward. You have to go back to your basics, that kind of thing. So in other words, this is your challenge. This is an incredible challenge to wrestle with. So grit your teeth because that's the facts, guys. And here's what it is accomplished by knowing this, which I think is enormously useful. It shows you in advance exactly how much plot you need, exactly how many times, you know, sequences of change you're going to have to arrange and invent. One of the things about it, it's in the book, and, and we'll talk about this stuff too later, but for instance, another thing about the hero goal sequences you cannot repeat. You cannot have two hero goal sequences that are basically the same. If you have one that is sort of the same of something that has preceded, you then have to add to it something major that changes it and makes it unique before you can use it. It shows you exactly how much plot you need, and sometimes this is cold chills at night because it's a lot of plot. It ensures that the hero will always be active. One of the two or three most deadly things that killed so many scripts from neophytes is a passive hero. Think, uh, the, the kind of story that things happen to the hero and the hero doesn't happen to the story, driving the story forward on their own. It doesn't work like that. If you do this, the hero is always active. 21 times they are in pursuit of a physical goal. They can never be passive. And what's interesting is that's what happens in movies that connect with audiences. The heroes are not passive, ever. They're doing something that moves the story forward. The story will never sag. That's built in. And what we know is that this is the best, you are building something for the best possible emotional involvement of your audience. This, we're talking psychology here, really. That's truly what it is. This is kind of a finger on a certain kind of absorption of a, of a ritual. This is what brings emotion and pleasure to an audience, and that's, that's what you have to wrestle with. Oh yeah, and this is good too. A lot of people talk about this. <clears throat> a lot of the grad students go back to their closets and pull out old stuff, you know, you got a half a script here and there, you gave up in, in high school or something like that, you thought you were, you were gonna go somewhere, and, uh, or you pull out old scripts, you finished a draft, maybe a couple of three drafts, but it just never quite worked. Didn't never sailed, you know, a couple people read it, and you know, they weren't into, put it away, take it out, take this paradigm and imply, you know, lay it over your older screenplay and it will show you exactly why that script didn't work. It'll show you only two or three interesting things happen in Act One, you know? Or well, maybe only three or four interesting things happened in Act Two. No, that's not enough. I think that's, you're finally off the hook, you know? Okay, you're right. See, you survived. <laughs> Thank you for your patience through glitches and all, uh, and allowing me to get through this. I know it was a lot <clears throat> to, uh, to sit through. Um, 
questions, <clears throat> any questions, uh, we're going to take a break. You finally get to go to the bathroom. And, uh, and when you come back, it'll be just us, and, and, and we can relax a bit and talk about some of this stuff and any questions you want to throw out, um, have at me. Okay? So thanks. Break time. Yeah.